William Donald Schaefer was the 44th mayor of Baltimore. Schaefer's great love for the city was sometimes expressed by his force of will and a tremendous impatience with those who stood in his way. Tremendous temper, which could be very explosive and which he used to intimidate people. He was the leader of his hometown, but there was no denying he had inherited a city that seemed to be at the edge of failure. To say that he was a bricks and mortar pothole guy is an understatement. He really thought inductively. He didn't start with a concept. He thought with what was going on in the street and then you could build a concept. Very, very strong-willed and bombastic and difficult and difficult. But you know, I mean, he was a genius in his own way and I, and I think lots of, um, lots of geniuses are very difficult. In the fall of 1975, Mayor Schaefer made two important changes that went a long way towards bringing stability to the school system. The first change was to appoint a new chairman of the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners, Mark Joseph. When I took over as president, uh, the school system was close to twice the size it, it is today. It was 145,000 kids and it was the sixth largest school system in the country. And it's governed by a board of, of nine people. That's a heck of a way to run a railroad. He was not the rich and powerful developer he is today, but he was plenty influential. Mark played a unique role in the sometimes chaotic world of William Donald Schaefer. He was a Harvard-trained lawyer and had been the deputy housing commissioner for several years. So I understood how all that stuff worked, uh, and I understood the, uh, the interplay between the various agencies and the finance department. That was a ma major advantage I had in uh, uh, becoming president of the school board. The second appointment central to educational change in Baltimore City was that of Dr. John Crewe as the new superintendent of schools in 1976. Dr. Crewe's leadership style gave the school system the stability that had been missing for so long. I remember him, he would sit there and he would kind of listen and listen and listen. And then at a point he said, well, tell me exactly what you need. He had come up through the system, he was, you know, I mean, he, he respected the deputies and the, the assistant superintendent. He wasn't going to be a divider in terms of racial politics. He was willing to appoint people on the merits. He worked well with the mayor and he worked well with, uh, with uh, Joseph. He was a, a welcome change. I think that was a good time, a healing time for the, for the system. It was John Crew who reactivated the leadership committee for School for the Arts. By year's end, Margaret's leadership committee had presented a proposal to the mayor's office. William Donald Schaefer, who was the mayor at the time, I remember him calling her lovingly a nudge, uh, which is somebody who just doesn't leave it alone. And uh, apparently every time he saw her, which as she rose in the school system was more and more often, um, she would pull this coattail and whisper in his ear something about, you know, we got to get the school started, we got to get the school started. A school for the arts was exactly the kind of project that would appeal to this mayor. It was ambitious, unique, and most importantly, the project came ready-made with people like Margaret Armstrong willing to do the work. Margaret Armstrong, as, as you know, was uh, in, in many respects the, the person who kept the flame alive. She asked Walter Sunheim, as I recall, who was a good friend of mine, in 54, he was chairman of the board, to come and talk to me and ask me if I would meet with Margaret, and, which I was happy to do. And then Margaret explained what the task force had been doing. 
Mark Joseph could also see that a school devoted to developing the talents of the children of the city would go a long way towards addressing the uneven services of city schools. The school system had had this tremendous racial divide. I was especially looking for ways to close that, change the images of what people thought of the system. And wanting to demonstrate that the system could do excellent things. Mark Joseph was one person who wanted to do something, wanted to help. I talked to uh, John Crew and also uh, to the mayor. And so now it looks like we can get this, this thing going. Ever since the idea of a school for the arts was conceived, the neighborhood that would house the school seemed as important as the school itself. There were many areas to choose from, but finding a building, that was a different matter. Then, in June 1976, Mark Joseph discovered the perfect building. He walked around and it was just this light bulb went off and he thought, he was president of the school board at the time, School for the Arts. He knew that Schaefer would love this. When I brought him here and showed him was how physically this place would fit for because of the ballroom and the stage. It was called the Alcazar, the fortress. Built in 1924, the Knights of Columbus building stood on the corner of Madison and Cathedral in the Mount Vernon district of Baltimore. Its marquee, crystal chandeliers, and most especially its ballroom would give an art school the look and feel equal to the other arts institutions in the area. Baltimoreans understood that this was a fancy place at one time, mm -hmm. but it wasn't fancy when I came to see it. It was in great need of being fixed up. Economic stagnation of the 1970s had taken its toll on the city. Finding funds available for the purchase and renovation of any building was a challenge. But another piece of federal legislation was working its way through Congress, President Carter's Supplemental Housing Authorization Act, passed in April of 1977, was money to be used exclusively for the renovation of old buildings. This money, along with additional money from the state and funds from the Baltimore City Council, made possible the purchase of the Alcazar and its renovation into a school. I forgot who it was now. Somebody who said, you don't want the School for the Arts to go in that old building. I said, any building that is their own, it's good for me. I'm going with it. In March 1977, Dr. Crew directed his deputy, Dr. Rebecca Carroll, to reactivate the plans for School for the Arts. Dr. Carroll appointed Richard Marzinski of the Department of Education to chair the committee. He was to be assisted by Margaret Armstrong, who had recently retired from the school system, but retained every ounce of passion to see her school come to be. Also in attendance was Leslie Shepard. I wanted to do something in the arts in Baltimore, and I picked up the phone and called the mayor's office to talk about lucky, right time, right place. And I said, oh, yes, but we're starting up an office on art and culture. And they gave me the number, and I met with Richard, and I was the second staff person there. She was my assistant in the development of this whole thing. Uh, when I became... Uh, uh, the first director of the Mayor's Committee on Art and Culture, I hired her and she was with me during that period when I was recalled to, to do the School for the Arts. The first meeting was held on September 20th, 1977 at the Baltimore City Schools headquarters on 25th Street. Its members worked in very much the same way as the Leadership Committee, 
crafting curriculum, and developing budgets. To further develop the details of the school, the task force set up a series of intense brainstorming sessions. They called it a charrette. The charrette was a really wonderful indication, I think, of the fact that we were going highest standards pre-professional. I got money to invite two people in each area of art, music, theater, and dance from New York, from Buffalo, from other places in the country to come to Baltimore. And I got rooms for them and they were to eat there and sleep there and uh, develop the curriculum content of the School for the Arts. Mayor Schaefer, Mark Joseph, and John Crew gave opening remarks. James Greaves, the architect in charge of renovating the school, presented the plans for construction. Then, the members went straight to work in an all-day session. Instead of just all sitting down and saying, here's the curriculum, here's what we should be doing, is we brought in national experts to tell us if you're going to prepare students for the next stage, the next level, the conservatory uh, and art college, here's the way you need to prepare them. We wanted to tell the people who were in the public schools that we were going to do what would be the very best thing we could do for the children. The people who listened to us thought, I guess we were sort of, you know, a little bit off because we didn't do it, we didn't want to do it the way that everybody did it. By month's end, a curriculum for the Baltimore School for the Arts had been developed. It laid out a course students needed to take to become professionals in their field, to train, discipline, and inspire them, and to give them the power to distinguish themselves in the competitive world of professional arts. Over the course of two years, the task force produced hundreds of pages of curriculum. They gave the school its proper name, adding Baltimore to the moniker. They refined the vision of the school and brought the dream one step closer to reality. But while the task force had done so much of the planning for the school, at times it could become mired in the sheer enormity of the project. Meetings of the task force sometimes grew tense as competing visions of how the school should operate emerged. Some members of the task force wanted the school to be like other vocational schools in the city. Others wanted the school to be something altogether unique. And how, how do you create something that can flourish in the arts within this system that has been suffocating? It gotten kind of bogged down, and uh, the mayor had gotten impatient with the progress being made. Negative publicity irritated this mayor as much as incompetence, and the stories of delays in construction of the school sold newspapers. And he, he'd gone to Mark Joseph, who, as I said, was the head of the school board, and told him to, you know, to get with it, get this thing going. As the chairman of the school board, Mark could see the very precarious position of this fledgling school. BSA was unlike any of the other schools in the city. Its mission, to be a leading pre-professional performing arts high school, would drive every decision the school made, from budgets and staffing to the kind of supplies it purchased. No large bureaucracy could be sensitive enough to the obscure needs of a single school, no matter how well-functioning. The idea of showing that you could get something excellent worthwhile, and, and I also was concerned about how do you get some separation between the school system. Only an independent board could address the needs of the school so quickly. I wanted to form a board of overseers. For that purpose, Mark enlisted Tony Carey. I was a lawyer at the time and had been in practice maybe for 15 years and uh, with a firm, a venerable, uh, Bacher and Howard that uh, sort of encouraged people to encourage the lawyers to get out and do pro bono work. Uh, I had a draft of what the Board of Overseers relationship with the school system would look like and we had to, to create the Board of Overseers and so forth and that, that's where Tony came in. 
Tony agreed to become the first chairman of the Board of Overseers for the Baltimore School for the Arts. We put together the, this, this first board and I wanted crew on it, the superintendent, because that, that had a good a nexus to the school system. Local luminaries, Sylvester Campbell, Nathan Carter, a lot of the important figures in the arts at the time. The, the next great thing that happened was the charter. I had this, this draft which then became the essentially the charter. All of the policies that that had been incorporated in a, a resolution that Mark Joseph and I had worked out with the with the school board. Everything that we needed to succeed was in that document. Everything. 